Let me tell you something. You ain't seen an insurrection yet. You keep on pushing our buttons, you low down, sorry compromisers. You God hating communist America, you'll find out what an insurrection is because we ain't playing your garbage. We ain't playing your mess. My Bible says that the church of the living God is an institution that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And the Bible says they will take it by force. That's what the Bible says. Support my Patreon. If y'all want me to do this full time, then I need a good enough excuse to explain to my wife why I left my job. And more importantly, the health insurance that covers me, her, and our two little hell spawn. Without her nodding in silent agreement while simultaneously plotting to smother me in my sleep. For all the single folks in the audience, that's basically what marriage is. Waking up every day and finding a reason not to kill each other. So I've tried my best over the like year or so lifespan of this channel to not use it as a virtual pulpit. Even though the more time I spend on YouTube, the more I'm convinced that that might actually be an easier grift than conservative clout chasing. Because if there's anything more gullible than a Republican, it's a religious one. Anyway, with that being said, I have not been shy at all about sharing my beliefs, even if I've tried to not push them on anybody. And for the most part, y'all have been accepting, if not receptive. Some of y'all have even gone so far as to ask me how I even got to the point of believing what I believe. And eventually I will get to the whole story once that inevitable Q&A session comes about if and when I become relevant enough to feel like it's warranted. But for the time being, I'll just give y'all a little insight onto what got me to where I am today. Well, sometime between my sophomore and junior year of college, I discovered a school of thought called liberation theology. And for those of you who don't know what that is, According to many traditional theologians, it's, in a word, satanic. So it must be good, right? So this video isn't meant by any means to be a comprehensive course on liberation theology. I mean, there's plenty of resources out there for you to look up and do your own scholarly research on. But I do want to talk a little bit about it and two of its most prominent figures to give you all a little more insight on the way that my mind works and what Christianity is actually supposed to be, <laughs> at least according to the guy who kicked it all off in the first place. Liberation theology is a school of Christian thought that argues that part of the Christian's responsibility being an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven, after all, is to liberate oppressed peoples from unjust world systems, specifically capitalism. In that way, it's very much a spiritual successor, pun definitely intended, of the social gospel movement of the 19th century, which itself was a product of the Wesleyan holiness tradition, which also gave birth to Pentecostalism, which itself gave birth to the neo-charismatic movement, which itself gave birth to modern day consumerist Christianity. And yeah, the irony is not lost on me at all. However, liberation theology doesn't just stop at economic injustice, but it also argues that it is the believer's responsibility to combat concepts like racism, casteism, patriarchy, etc., as evidenced by the existence of Dalit theology, womanist theology, and something that we're going to pay particular attention to toward the end, black theology. Liberation theologists argue that the injustices we see in our world are not mere products of individual sin, but also of societal sin. Again, very much in line with the social gospel movement, which emphasized along with individual moralism, i.e. holiness. So abstaining from 
drinking and extramarital sex, etc. The importance of combating things like racism, slavery, poverty, and homelessness. I make that point because me growing up, holiness, or as it's more popularly understood, one that's Pentecostal, I was always sort of taught that that word was limited to individual moralism. However, both historically and theologically, that understanding isn't correct. Both the Old Testament prophets and Jesus himself made a point to make it be known that holiness meant not just acknowledging and addressing the symptoms of systemic oppression, but to combat those very systems that created that condition in the first place, even going so far as to dismantle them. <laughs> Which I mean, duh, that's literally the first thing Jesus says after wandering in the desert for a month and a half, starving himself. Bear Grylls could never. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. So in this video, I'm going to spend the bulk of my time, actually all of my time, focusing on Latin and black theology, because these are the two schools that I'm the most familiar with. Latin theology rules largely as a response to the Catholic Church's enabling of imperialist, Eurocentric, and American powers' destructive influence on Latin American governments. I mean, this is pretty much par for the course, right? I mean, the church had been enabling these kind of powers going back to the colonial period. And this is why most of those big name Latin American revolutions during the 20th century, like that in Mexico during the earlier part of that century and that in Cuba in the late 50s were largely anti-clerical. After World War II, the U.S. had given a metric butt ton of aid to Western Europe and Japan. However, this led to dissatisfaction among the Latin American nations that provided low cost raw materials for the war effort. This, along with Castro's ousting of Bautista in 1959, caused a lot of friction between the U.S. and her neighbors to the South. As a result, John, men weren't meant to be monogamous, Kennedy signed off on a 10-year, 20-plus billion dollar plan of aid for Latin America called the Alliance for Progress, which, I mean, sounded good on paper until you obviously read through all the fine print and saw clauses like one that encouraged Latin American governments to promote, quote, conditions that would encourage foreign investment in the region. This, in addition to corporate U.S. lobbyists lobbying for the government not to give aid to Latin American governments unless they agree to not allow Latin businesses to compete directly with American corporations in that region. And I mean, y'all have seen and heard this story a million times before. It's colonialism 101. I mean, the feds are, if nothing else, predictable, are they not? Which makes you wonder how, like, Three-fourths of the Atlanta rap scene has caught more Ricos than Future has paternity suits. Like, I mean, y'all are literally using IG Live like a confession booth. Then for what? Some clout and some hood rat groupie coochie? I swear y'all niggas are goofier than a Disney movie. Probably the biggest reason why the Alliance for Progress failed is because the U.S. treated Latin America like it was basically just Western Europe, just with browner people and better food. Thus, it being dubbed many times the Marshall Plan for Latin America. The problem is most Latin American governments had no interest in adopting Eurocentric ideas on government and economy planning. So Kennedy's plan was basically to just throw as much money as humanly possible at the upper and middle class elites of that region, like the ones who fled Big Bad Fidel and his wealth redistribution monster and hope they would do the right thing with it. And if I'm going to keep it a buck, sometimes they did, like in Venezuela and Chile. 
but most times they didn't. Like in every other Latin American nation where the elites owned anywhere between 70 and 90 percent of the land and just straight up refused to redistribute to the largely rural and poor populations of their respective nations. And that's another thing. Part of the reason why the Marshall Plan was successful is because Western Europe was already industrialized and thus it was a lot easier for them to urbanize what wasn't already which at the end of the day is what the U.S. wanted for Latin America. And if we haven't learned anything else through Stalin and Mao, is that when you try to go from a nation of backwater hick towns to midtown Manhattan overnight, well, according to Twitter and a handful of tanky tubers that won't be named here, everything just goes swimmingly. And tens of millions of people don't die needlessly of starvation and straight up state sponsored terrorism because some terminally online, presumably suburbanite 20 something who just discovered capitalism was bad yesterday when they realized they couldn't go to the uni of their dreams because of how backward and predatory our student loaning system is, says so. Yeah, you ought to be ashamed, bucko. See, the thing is, though, Kennedy's efforts were not at all humanitarian, which I mean, dull. They were just a thinly veiled attempt to undermine Soviet influence in the region. As a result, Kennedy would not give aid to governments that were not explicitly anti-communist, even going so far as to demand that a recipients outlaw domestic communism as well as break ties with and aid in the U.S.'s economic strangulation of Cuba. And many of these governments, though they did support the alliance, also expressed their concern over these demands because, as far as they were concerned, Castro posed no threat to them, which, I mean, again, dull. But because colonialism, Kennedy wasn't trying to hear any of that. So he commissioned the number of covert operations to oust constitutionally elected Latin American leaders. For example, Frodenze in Argentina, Goulart in Brazil, and Arevalo in Guatemala. And even after Kennedy went all scatterbrained in 1963, LBJ expanded the crusade into Bolivia, Argentina, Chile, and the Dominican Republic. As a result, equal parts anti-communist and authoritarian regimes stepped in and filled the power vacuum and brought along with them decades worth of despotic rule, human rights violations, and just overall very, very bad stuff that evidently anyone who calls themselves a communist is incapable of, even if that communism is literally just fascism with a hammer and sickle tattooed on its forehead because some middle class white kid who just discovered Das Capital yesterday says so. You should be ashamed, bucko. As a result, many of the clergy that called Latin America home responded by saying that the governments of their respective nations, as well as the Roman Catholic Church, had grown insensitive to the needs and interests of their largely poor and rural populations. Furthermore, they insisted that they had allowed neo-colonial powers in the West to come in and exploit the population for their own interest and that of those governments and the church. And as a result, in 1968, during the Second Council of Latin American Bishops, a letter was written that basically said just that and was sent to the Vatican. This, folks, is the origin of Latin liberation theology. Thus, liberation theologians broke away from the centuries-long tradition of the institutional church allying itself with the established power for no other reason than its own interest. Further, liberation theologians saw themselves as a revival of Christianity as practiced pre-Constantine and, more importantly, as taught by Jesus himself. Father Gustavo Gutierrez, who literally wrote the book on 
Latin theology in 1971 is largely considered the father of this movement. What he argues is that Eurocentric theology did not reflect the real world conditions of the majority of Christians, specifically those in Latin America. And as a result, overemphasized the importance of eschatological elements, i.e. the second coming of Christ in the afterlife at the expense of practical elements of Christianity, i.e. establishing God's kingdom on earth by loving your neighbor. Faith is not limited to affirming the existence of God. No, faith tells us that God loves us and demands a loving response. This response is given through love for human beings, and that is what we mean by commitment to God and our neighbor. He did this by highlighting how in both the Old and New Testaments, God and his prophets always allied themselves with the poor, even going so far as to proclaim and enact judgment on not only those who actively oppressed them, but those who stood in silent complicity. Thus, he argues that God is just as concerned with material as he is spiritual poverty. Furthermore, arguing that if one is to align themselves with God, then they must stand in solidarity with the poor, not only through prayer, but by also actively combating systems and institutions that create their condition, specifically capitalism the poverty of the poor is not a call to generous relief action but a demand that we go and build a different social order this folks is what is known in theological terms as the preferential option for the poor and is a concept that actually dates at least as far back as the early methodists thus their participation in the underground railroad gutierrez as well as basically all liberation theologists argue that poverty is not a inescapable or static constant but rather it is a direct result of systems and institutions that create such a condition gutierrez as well as others uses frameworks like marxism particularly marx's thoughts on exploitation and class warfare as well as dependency theory to argue that neo-colonial western powers are largely responsible for the condition of their respective nations which i mean <laughs> again duh nigga now let me stop here and make this somewhat pedantic point liberation theology does use marxism as well as a number of other frameworks as tools but it is not marxist why well because karl marx was a fuckboy to support my point i'll highlight the fact that liberation theologists unlike say marxist leninists do not advocate for a vanguard led violent overthrow of any regime or government but rather they advocate for direct confrontation through nonviolent grassroots populist movements. So like the civil rights movement or the Indian independence movement or Arab Spring or whatever Occupy Wall Street was supposed to be, but never really became because I'm gonna keep it a buck with y'all. We didn't really know what we were mad at. All we knew was that the rent was too damn high. Oh, look, it's the guy. Now, before y'all jump down my throat and try to explain to me how nonviolent resistance is just the IRL equivalent of a blackout Tuesday square. I'm not talking about those state sanctioned kumbaya drum circles that your favorite politician of choice participates in to distract you from their donor list. But what I'm talking about are those activities that are disruptive enough to the status quo that it basically makes life a living hell for anyone who wouldn't pay attention to the cause otherwise. So basically, just like what all of those railroad workers threatened to do a few weeks ago before the powers that be agreed to a parlay. And see, here's the thing, folks. I kind of consider myself something of a tough love lefty, if that makes any sense. 
what that means is I don't really have the patience for armchair revolutionaries or their takes. What I'm saying is the U.S. government pumps a literal trillion dollars worth of taxpayer revenue into defense every single year. And you really think that a bunch of play play weekend Zapatistas are going to overthrow the most powerful military in the world? I mean, the odds of that happening are slimmer than an Eminem LP. And I know a lot of y'all who think that way probably aren't old enough to remember 9-11, but nigga, did you not see what happened after 9-11? You think we're living in a dystopia now. You try storming the Capitol being anything other than a straight white male, and we'll see how quickly you last without being mounted on the White House wall. My point is, most of y'all who say stuff like this aren't really built like that to begin with. God knows you couldn't tell a Beretta from a Beret if it could save your life. And those of you who actually are, well, chances are you probably have a bug in your house right now. In which case, God bless America, Semper Fi and MAGA 2024. That's for the FBI agent that's hanging out in my hallway closet right now. Yeah, I know all about you, Jeffrey. Additionally, personally, I feel like nonviolent resistance is the best way to sway public opinion in your favor. If you don't believe me, just use the civil rights movement as a case study. Point that I'm trying to get at is that sometimes turning the other cheek isn't so much about being the bigger person as it is seeing the bigger picture and playing for the end game. What may appear like an L right now is really just you pulling off a strategy that no one in the building, including your op, saw coming until he was lying flat on his back, staring at the ceiling, wondering what the heck happened between rounds 10 and 15. That's a Ali Foreman reference for those of you who aren't staring aimlessly into the bottomless chasm of mortality. But perhaps most importantly, what liberation theologists argue is that all theology is subjective, which I mean, even the Bible itself says that. What I mean is our respective understanding of God and God's word is limited by our worldview, which itself is determined by a number of factors, including race, gender, socioeconomic status, what part of the world you come from, etc. Therefore, a Eurocentric interpretation of the scriptures is not going to be adequate for, say, <laughs> an indigenous population or any people of color for that matter, because that interpretation of scripture is colored less by what God really wants than it is by Europeans perception of themselves and the people around them. I mean, this is literally how we got the curse of ham theology, which I talked about in the last video. But if you didn't watch the last video, first of all, I'm going to strangle you. And second of all, it's pretty much the justification that Europeans used to enslave tens of millions of black people over the course of like 400 years or so. To make a long story short, Europeans cherry picked literally one story from the book of Genesis and then QAnon did into the transatlantic slave trade and then had the audacity, the impudence, the unmitigated gall to turn around and to do this. The option for the poor is an option, using a difficult word, it is a theocentric option. That is, it is centered in God. The poor are loved preferentially by God, not because they are good, but because they are poor. Because they live in a condition that is contrary to His will. And this should be our attitude, a preference for the poor, not because they are better, more good, moral, or religious than others, although that could also be true, but it is not the primary reason. It is because they are poor. Black theology, consequently enough, at least as a scholarly school of thought, was formed largely in response to Anglo-centric Protestant theology, which, like I've said in the past, is literally just white supremacy dressed up in a cassock and clergy collar. 
And if this video gets near the kind of traction that I'm hoping that it does, I know a lot of white Jesus worshipers are going to be salty about that. And I mean, I mean, it is what it is. I've been saying that for like 10 years and people have been getting mad at me, even a disturbingly large number of black folks. But facts is facts, bruh, no matter how myth they make you. Both Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield two of early America's most important theologians owned slaves and furthermore bent further backwards than Inosuke Hashibara to try and justify it. This despite the Apostle Paul writing an entire epistle that was the closest thing in Judeo-Roman society to the Liberator newsletter of William Lloyd Garrison's. Every major American Christian reformation has experienced some split over the slavery question. I mean, I did a whole video on this that's up on my Patreon if y'all want to watch it. And those of y'all who have watched it already know what I'm about to say. The Southern Baptist Convention was formed for no other reason than as a defense of white supremacy by way of chattel slavery. And also as a sanctuary for sex offenders, apparently. And listen, I'm gonna keep it a buck with y'all. Among a good number of the company that I keep IRL, my personal theology is considered very liberal. But I mean, I I, I really don't care. You know, it doesn't bother me. Like your choir director is a bottom and the whole church knows it. Matter of fact, it was the Sunday school president that told them. In fact, according to her, during last year's convocation, he was getting his pipes cleaned out by the revivalist that you invited for the last missionary anniversary service. Again, white people, I don't expect y'all to understand what any of that means. Just nod and laugh in agreement. Y'all already do it for Corden and Fallon. One more is not going to hurt you. And if you don't, you're racist. My point is, if you are going to be a literalist and completely disregard any of the historical or cultural context of what you're reading, which in itself is stupid, but let's just try to crawl before we run a marathon here. You can't just cherry pick the passages that either A, are the easiest for you to understand or B, and more likely seem to dump on all of the things that you just don't like. Like women pastors or gay people, which, by the way, I'm not even going to get into the whole women preacher thing because there are multiple, like multiple references in the Bible itself to women preachers. But as far as those anti-gay passages are concerned, according to scholars, you know, the people who spend the bulk of their life studying Aramaic and Greek and ancient Hebrew to actually read the original text in the context with which it was meant so that they will know what the writers were actually trying to say. Well, according to them, those passages are less about the act itself than the context and or consensuality of said act, i.e. ritual prostitution and or don't worry, I'm going to edit that out for the YouTube bots. And listen, folks, my point isn't to throw shade at anybody, but it's simply that I was taught a lot, like a lot of wrong stuff about the Bible growing up. And it wasn't until I ceased just rote memorization and actually studied the written word in its historical and cultural context, moreover, picked up a Bible that wasn't written by a bunch of grumpy old white dudes in 17th century England who are more concerned with maintaining the primacy of the bishops of the Church of England and the king himself than they were giving an accurate translation of the written word that I began to understand that. And... As the one who left the cave, I feel like part of my responsibility is to go back and tell the ones who are still there what I saw, whether they're willing to receive it or not. And I'm doing a heck of a job now, ain't I?
that's called sarcasm, by the way. But that tangent aside, I know for a fact, the way that I know Future is going to flake on his next kid's birthday party, that the Bible has a ton more to say about systemic injustice and its perpetrators than it does anything that your favorite televangelist says it does. My point being that if we're going to just go according to what the Bible says, God is much more concerned with the state of the oppressed than he is whether or not you're having butt sex. Again, I'm going to just edit that part out. But somehow the architects of American Christianity missed that. I wonder why. Which now, folks, brings us to black theology, which both convinced me to reclaim Christianity as my chosen belief system and radicalize my politics. The origin of black theology, at least as a scholarly school, is typically attributed to Dr. James Cone. But if we're just going to keep it a buck, the black church over the course of its history has always been a radical institution just somehow over the years we kind of lost that somewhere between high five your neighbor and this nigga i'm not gay no more i am delivered i don't like men no more now quick disclaimer here everything i'm about to say is highly highly speculative so there you have that but I kind of sort of disagree with the general idea that Christianity was introduced to West Africa during the 15th century when the Portuguese arrived with all their booze and blunderbusses. I mean, we know for a fact that in East Africa, Christianity had established itself at least as early as 330 CE when it became the official state religion of the Aksumite Empire. In fact, behind Jesus himself and the Apostle Paul, the third most important figure in early church history is St. Augustine of Hippo, a North African, North African, but still African. Matter of fact, it's because of him that we have things like Western philosophy and Western society's toxic love-hate relationship with all bedroom activities. I mean, Jesus, Augie, just because you regret being a hoe doesn't mean you got to ruin it for the rest of us, nigga. Additionally, some of the most underratedly beautiful structures in the world, in my opinion at least, are the rock-hewn churches of Lalibela, which can be found in modern-day Ethiopia. These were a part of a project commissioned in the 12th and early 13th century by King Jebre Maskel Lalibela of the Zagwe dynasty, who wanted to recreate the holy city of Jerusalem in his kingdom. My point being, if Christianity had established itself in Eastern and North Africa by as late as late antiquity, and we also know for a fact that North Africans were crossing the Sahara, trading everything from goods to bodily fluids with sub-Saharan Africans, how do we know that they didn't trade religious ideas? Like, again, this is all extremely he said, she said, but I have personally known native or at least first generation uh, West Africans who practice a form of Christianity that they say is their tribe's tradition going back centuries before the white man ever showed up. And who am I to deny their experience? And I could do a whole video on the similarities between black church and African spiritualist traditions, which I mean, I kind of already did. But my point is whether it was before or after the Portuguese arrived in West Africa, when West Africans were introduced to the Judeo-Christian God, they did not see what the Europeans saw, which I mean, again, duh. Again, American Christianity is just sanctified white supremacy. So black Christians did not see God as a God of static order, but rather they saw God as a liberator, one who would disrupt the status quo if doing so served the interest of the most marginalized and oppressed people. 
So when they opened their Bibles, what they saw was Moses in the story of the Exodus. They saw the Babylonian captivity and all of those stories. Daniel and the lions, then the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. And they saw all of the Old Testament prophets, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Elijah and Isaiah in particular, who again went out of their way to proclaim judgment against those who actively oppressed the oppressed. And most importantly, they saw Jesus himself. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and of the plate, but inside they are full of extortion and greed. This is pretty much the thesis of James Cone's God of the Oppressed, in which he makes two points that are integral to understanding black theology. One, all theology is subjective. And two, God is always on the side of the marginalized. In fact, the only real difference between the OT and NT gods is that the Old Testament God was a lot more direct, like <laughs> straight up murky firstborn direct, like create a STD induced national health crisis direct in order to achieve that end of liberating his people. If you know, you know. While the New Testament God endues his believers with the power of the Holy Spirit, which, according to Christian theology, is literally the spirit of God dwelling inside of the believer for the purpose of performing all of those acts that are necessary to establishing the kingdom of God on earth. Which boils down to loving your neighbor again. It's from Cone that we get such inflammatory quotes as <laughs> the title of this thumbnail and the one that I really wanted to use before Cooler Heads talked me out of demonetizing myself. If God is white, kill God. I make that point because since his death in 2018, there's been an effort as with basically all important black figures to whitewash and to cuddleify Cone's legacy because the thing is his legacy is so large and so important to not just black or liberation but theology period you can't ignore it at the same time the vast majority of what he had to say directly contradicted mainstream theology and in a lot of ways still does specifically both white and black theologians alike tried to use MLK as a rebuff of Cone. Surprise, surprise there, saying that unlike Dr. King, Cone rejected the Christian principle of reconciliation. So basically forgiveness in lay speak. And like I said in the past, obviously these people never actually studied King or else they would have known that King never advocated for unconditional reconciliation for white America. Rather, he advocated for direct confrontation with white America concerning its sins against black and poor people. I mean, we had a whole freaking civil rights movement and poor people's campaign about that. Rather, King argued that it was only after expressing contrition through restorative justice that white America could truly reconcile itself with its black brethren. There was a national apology for slavery. It was called the Civil War where 700,000 Americans died. Remorse, the one cultural commodity that, w w wait a minute, I, I did this joke already, Clarence. And I mean, this is basically what Cone argued, just a lot blacker and angrier, which is why some people called him a black Nazi. Talk about pot meat kettle, right? Now, me personally, I like to think of Cone as the bell hooks of, liberation theology what i mean by that is nine times out of ten whenever somebody asks me for some resources or who they should study concerning the field i refer them to comb that being said he was by no stretch of the imagination perfect in his assessments you see cone not unlike your 
favorite Hotep cousin or your KS standing stepbrother or basically every black man during the 1960s and the vast majority of black women during that period believed that if the plight of the black man could be resolved, then that would somehow magically trickle down to the rest of marginalized America, leading him to largely exclude black women and LGBTs from his demands for restorative justice and many times making them out to be the enemy. And I say all of this with the caveat that later in life, he did retract a lot of that to become much more egalitarian. Again, something that white Christian America seems to struggle with. Surprise, surprise. So, yeah, I, I get it. I understand why a lot of Christians and at least institutionalized Christianity has developed such a bad rap over the years. That being said, it's downright irresponsible for us to completely erase the history of the social gospel and how it influenced people like John Wesley and Leroy Sutherland and William Lloyd Garrison to become abolitionists. Not to mention basically every early Methodist north of the Mason-Dixon line. And this isn't even to mention people like Ida B. Wells and Fannie Lou Hamer, Ralph Abernathy, Adam Clayton Powell, C.T. Vivian, and of course, Martin Luther the King himself, who were not only inspired by, but propelled into activism by their Christian faith. And I'm not going to lie, this video in a lot of ways is a culmination of a lot of the frustration that I've felt over the past few years being a lefty believer, even among folk that I consider myself privileged to call my peers within this YouTube space. I see a lot of generalizing of Christians were either an anti-intellectual cult of conspiracy mongering diet clansmen or we're the cast of Honk for Jesus, just with the volume turned to like seven. Okay, maybe eight. And I'm not going to cap like that's not a lot of people, but it's by no means all of us. And I feel like a lot of non-believers left of Liz Cheney are so preoccupied with holding on to their preconceptions that have been molded by mainstream media, no less, to the point that they allowed their implicit bias to cause them to wind up coloring an entire demographic of people. Exactly. What I'm saying is, yeah, there are a lot of a-holes who like to cherry pick Bible verses to explain away their bigotry. And there's also a ton of Holy Ghost grifters out there as well. But there are also plenty of William Barbers. There's plenty of Beth Allison Bars and Jamar Tisby's. I mean, even Jamal Bryant and E. Dewey Smith, who admittedly are very, very socially conservative, which I mean, again, it's just status quo in black America have never been shy about using their literal pulpit to preach and act against systemic and institutionalized oppression against the poor and POCs. I mean, even TD Jakes, the face or at least black face of the prosperity gospel bought like 95 acres last year to develop affordable housing. But you're not going to hear about that nearly as much as you are. Joel Osteen hiding racks of cash in his church's bathroom paneling like he's preparing for a 10 year bid upstate or something. Because you see, here's the thing, the vast, vast majority of Christian ministers, both at home and abroad, are nowhere near rich. Many aren't even what you would call middle class if such a thing still exists. I bet you didn't know that half of all U.S. churchgoers attend a church with a congregation of 150 or fewer members. I bet you didn't know that the depression rate among pastors in the U.S. is twice the national average. 
I bet you also didn't know that less than 10% of U.S. Christians attend one of those mega churches that we love to lambast so much. I bet you also didn't know that the median income for a pastor who pastors a church of 150 or fewer folk is only like 50 racks a year. And many wind up supplementing by working part, if not full time for not only themselves, but also the church's income. Yeah, I bet you didn't know that either. Something like 75 percent to 90 percent of U.S. churchgoers don't actually give to their church and only like 5 percent of U.S. Christians overall give to their church. My point is, in a lot of ways, the image of the modern Christian minister has been grossly exaggerated and in some ways fabricated by your favorite fake woke left of center comic and tanky tweet decker. My point is I've had to learn the hard way how not to assume superiority over another person's beliefs, especially when what I know about those beliefs are based on little more than a caricature. Listen, I'm not going to sit up here and try to convert y'all, or at least I'm not going to do the whole have you heard the good news spiel, but hopefully I can be an example of what a Christian, at least according to the guy who kicked the whole thing off in the first place, is supposed to be and what Christianity really means. And if I can't do that, then hopefully this singular verse will love your neighbor as yourself oh yeah it also means so a ten dollar seed into my patreon or you're going to hell that's what black jesus told me to tell you